Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, today, we'll be talking about how Netflix delivers key value in time series storage at any scale, which sounds pretty cool, I think. Um, I'm Joey Lynch. I'm an engineer on the platform team at Netflix, and this is... Vidya Arvin. Uh, I work for Data Abstractions. And today, we're going to tell you a little bit about how, over the past couple of years, uh, we've really been able to solve a lot of our core data problems by introducing these key value and time series abstractions that can kind of act at any scale that our users need. So let's start with our problems, because I think that kind of motivates why we had to do this. Uh, to put it succinctly, we have all the data at all the scale in all of the places. Specifically, uh, we handle tens of millions of requests per second to our databases. We handle billions of requests per second in caching layers. Um, and these are all open source storage engines. Uh, these have varied, you'll notice that there's like different kinds of latency SLOs and different amounts of data and different amounts of traffic. And it turns out that when you have all those different scale requirements and then you spread your data across four Amazon regions with uh, three availability zones each, so you have 12 copies of data to keep consistent at all times, serving the whole planet, um, you know, this, this is a pretty challenging problem. It gets harder when you realize that your different solutions overlap to your problems. So like, this is our universe of database requirements at Netflix, and a given use case might be satisfied by multiple different solutions. Sometimes we have use cases that live off in the no solution land, and that's where data platform comes in and tries to build a new solution, or tries to convince the user that actually they needed something different and their requirement can maybe fit somewhere else. Um, but it's not static, right? Like as use cases evolve, as over time, maybe they have more traffic because the feature is more useful, or excuse me, more used, or there's more storage as you uh, take more time. And then on top of that, you also have another variable, which is price. So, you know, at a certain scale, a cloud managed offering might be better, but then as you scale up, that gets real expensive, and maybe you need to migrate them to some kind of self managed storage. So, for all of these reasons, we realized that, you know, simple key value storage wasn't so simple. Depending on the use case, we had to use different storage engines and we had to be able to, to react rapidly to these changes in context. So, what's the solution? That sounds like some problems. What's the solution? Well, the solution that we've deployed at Netflix are what we call data abstraction layers, which are essentially uh, a layer of indirection. All things are solved by a good layer of indirection, right? Um, between the abstraction clients or the application servers and our storage engines. We abstract our clients from the storage engines. And today we'll be talking about two key abstractions we've rolled out over the past two years. The first being a key value abstraction, which exposes a multi-item map API on the left there. And then on the right, we're able to translate it to different storage engines, including different versions of those storage engines. So for example, this abstraction was key in our ability at Netflix to get off Cassandra Thrift. Um, that was, we basically had two storage engines on the right there, one for Thrift and one for CQL. Um, but it's not just limited to key value storage. We also have done this for time series storage. Uh, this is like an immutable event store handling potentially millions of requests per second, petabytes of state. And we're able to like combine things like Elasticsearch for full, full time series search with Cassandra for the actual storage. So that sounds, those sounds like some, some interesting techniques, but like, how does that actually work? And for that, Vidya is gonna, gonna show you the key concepts here. Thanks, Joey. Uh, I'm gonna just talk about some key concepts. After that, uh, Joey will introduce APIs and storage layer, how we formatted the storage layer for those use cases. Uh, first concept I'm gonna introduce is item potency token. Um, so systems fail, and when uh, the systems fail, you need to rewrite the data. Uh, can you rewrite safely? Uh, for example, if you take a bank transaction and you write twice the same withdrawal amount, is that safe? It's not, right? How do we deal with it? Uh, we first um, write with the item potency token. A, a token can be any token that you generate um, out of the system. And uh, you rewrite the same data with the same token. When you rewrite with the same token, it should dedupe. Um, we generate the item potency token through a timestamp and a generated token. The token can come from anywhere, any, from any system. Um, uh, you, for client-generated uh, tokens, where when you generate the token on the client side, you generate using a timestamp. Uh, you monotonically increase the timestamp by and adding random um, numbers to or uh, random time to the last bits of it. And you also uh, use a random nonce combine it together, mix it together to form the item potency token. What if you want a regional token? Uh, you can use systems like uh, Zookeeper and take a log from Zookeeper, or you can use a sequence generator where you uh, generate the sequence using the sequence generator, which generates a monotonically increasing batch of sequences, and then use that to write your um, uh, write with the token. So what if you need a globally 
um, uh, globally generated uh, token. So you can use transaction IDs. Transaction IDs has to be mixed into your um, mutations, and then um, perform, uh, writes has to be performed. So if we lay out all the things that we talked about, about tokens, uh, from client to a globally created token, uh, if we lay out with uh, client generated is more reliable, whereas globally generated is more uh, consistent, but uh, because of the network hops that it has to do, it's uh, less reliable. At Netflix, we use uh, client-generated one. We recommend client-generated ones in most cases. And in some cases, we, um, we use uh, regionally generated zookeeper logs or sequence generators. We uh, stay away from globally generated tokens. Um, we talk so much about clocks. Have we measured it? Across our Cassandra free 25,000 VMs, we, uh, we ran a script which measured our uh, time. And uh, clocks have drifts, clocks have queues. Um, uh, Joey has written a good memo about it. Uh, you can go read about it. And most of the time, we saw less than one millisecond of uh, clock drifts. In EC2, in EC2. EC2. So the next concept we are uh, talking about is chunking. Um, so when we have a small amount of data, sm small payloads, like one MB of data, um, we, we don't have to do anything. Just write it to the database. We are fine. What if you have a large uh, payload, like it's 30, 40, 100 MB of data? Um, we need a chunk. So during the write path, we first take the payload, chunk into 64 uh, kilobyte chunks, and then we write it to the uh, stage it to the server. Right? Uh, we don't we stage it. We don't commit it. But after uh, you write all the chunks to the server, uh, you take the chunk zero, uh, you create a chunk zero with all the information that you need uh, to perform the commit, and then commit chunk zero. Chunk zero validates your commit. Um, here, uh, we are, I'm talking about the same thing. Uh, the ch take the payload, chunk it, create an item out of it with has chunk number in it. Here, we, you can see that we are using item potency token. Um, you uh, perform writes per page. Uh, we do two MB pages, uh, uh, two MB of uh, chunks per day, uh, per page. Why a page? A uh, page because we can retry a page. Uh, if you put a stream, you have to retry the whole stream. Instead, page can be uh, retried individually. After you write, a, uh, write all the chunks, you perform chunk zero uh, um, commit. The commit uh, looks something like this. Um, uh, the commit doesn't have a value. It has chunk zero. It, we use the same item potency token to commit chunk zero. And we have information about how to retrieve those chunks by adding metadata about the chunk in chunk zero. Uh, for example, here you have chunk uh, count 43 and chunk size bytes and uh, hash. Uh, while reading, we first read chunk zero. That has all the information um, to how to go and retrieve the uh, uh, chunks. Um, and after that, you go and retrieve all the chunks. Um, in the, uh, to put it into perspective, where the uh, server side, we uh, per page, 4 MB of data is read. Um, after we read, uh, read 4 MB, we construct a page token, and we uh, send per page information back to the client. Um, chunks and the page token is sent back to the client. When we exhaust, it's uh, returning null as the page token. Uh, in the client side, we put all, uh, all of the data together, and we for, uh, formulate the payload back. Uh, after we formulate the payload back, uh, we return to the client. The next concept I'm going to talk about is compression. Um, uh, so Cassandra compresses, you all know, uh, LZ4 compression. Um, when you write the data into Cassandra, you, uh, Cassandra compresses. When you uh, take the data back, we decompress. Uh, when we replicate the data, it, compression and decompression happens again. Uh, for a 64 pay, uh, KB payload uh, of 0.5 ratio, um, there is a lot of compression and decompression happening here. Instead, what we can do is to compress client side. In client side, if you compress all the, uh, we, we save in commit logs, um, GC allocations are low, uh, IO, uh, we save in disk and network IO. Overall, we uh, save up to 300% of, uh, of uh, compression, decompression. Um, ha have we measured this? Yes, we've enabled compression in one of our use cases. If you ever use Netflix search, uh, uh, Napa powers Netflix search, and uh, they store JSON payloads. And when we compressed, uh, it compressed from 175 kilobytes to 44 kilobytes. Um, uh, it uses LZ4 compression. It's overall been of 75% reduction. 
The next concept I'm going to introduce is pagination. We talked about how to store the data uh, until now. How do we retrieve the data from, uh, from Cassandra, right? Um, when you think about uh, storage engines, storage engines come with uh, records, record counts, right? Like we retrieve records from um, uh, from the storage engine, any DB you may, uh, I, we can take. But uh, we have to think about in the server side, accumulating a page of a fixed size. Um, so we, uh, so I said we read. 4 MB of data and re return 4 MB of data as paginated value. So we sit here and read 4 MB of data from the, uh, from the database and accumulate the page and then return the page with the page token. Uh, so there is some kind of translation that is required uh, for us to do from uh, page count to page, uh, row count to page size. So um, the next con concept I'm going to introduce is adaptability, right? Uh, when we re sit and read those 4 MB of, uh, of pages from Cassandra uh, or any other database uh, and accumulate the system, uh, it is possible that we are doing multiple round trips or a single round trip should be able to fill up the 4 MB of data, right? Um, if that is the case, are we doing too much work? Right, um, you you might be doing uh, for large payloads. You might be retrieving a lot of data uh, and throwing away all of the data uh, before sending that to the client. Instead, if you can manipulate the fetch size while retrieving the data itself, you are fetching less data and doing less work to send it to the client. So uh, here we are adapting to the payload size and uh, the data uh, that we are reading by um, uh, manipulating the data uh, page tokens. Um, so the next one is, um, say for example, okay, we did all the work, accumulated a 4 MB of page. It took around uh, five seconds or less than 500 milliseconds, um, but client already gave up. Uh, client uh, SLO was 10, uh, 10 milliseconds. What do we do, right? We did all the work for nothing. You do, again, the same work for nothing, right? So instead, if we can send an SLO with your request, and the uh, server can understand that you have reached 80% of the SLO. Once you reach 80% of the SLO, you return back uh, to the client that um, whatever accumulated values you return back to the client, then uh, you are all good. You can uh, uh, go again to read more. So we talked about so much, uh, so many comp concepts. How do we do all this? Like meaning. Um, uh, all of these tuning has to be done by the client because client knows their data well, uh, their payload size well, how, wh uh, what are they retrieving uh, better, right? But that's uh, all the client tunings are error prone. For that, we have introduced signaling. Signaling is a mechanism where client uh, uh, says, I'm here, uh, handshake with the server, and the handshake returns a signal. And uh, the client keeps on doing that uh, every 30 seconds and uh, to get fresh data. In the signals, um, this is one of the examples where uh, on top there's a key value service who's, which is doing handshakes and, there, and on the bottom you have time series service doing handshakes and uh, getting back a signal. In the signal you're returning, do I have to chunk? If I have to chunk, what is the chunk size? And what, what, what should I chunk after? Using those signals, the client can adapt and learn and uh, change how they're chunking uh, the data in the client side. Uh, large play payloads must be broken down into chunks and you can enable it dynamically. Um, so uh, uh, compression, we talked about compression. You have algorithm here, LZ4. You can customize the algorithm as well uh, on the fly and return uh, a different uh, uh, client to do a different algorithm altogether, all dynamically. Fewer bytes are more reliable. So here uh, we talked about SLO a little bit earlier. Um, here I have a 10 second SLO. Uh, some, some clients need 10 second SLOs, some others need 50 second. Um, you, uh, depending, say for example, you have a, a consistency scope of eventual, you can say you can ret return uh, the data in 10 milliseconds, whereas if you have a global consistency, you go until 50 milliseconds. So with all that, we have uh, Joey talk about APIs. All right, that was fantastic. Thank you, Vidya. Those are a lot of concepts that we put together. And now for the rest of the talk, we're going to be kind of showing you how we put those in practice to actually make key value in time series APIs. So let's start with key value. So key value, uh, who's familiar with the Thrift API in Cassandra? Looks, hopefully looks, yeah, okay, it looks pretty familiar, right? Turns out that at Netflix, this is what most people want from a key value store. 
Um, they want some kind of hash map, like partition key, and then a sorted set of bytes to bytes. This covers almost all of our key value use cases in Netflix. Now, we do have some like type libraries on top of this to help people like store longs and stuff, but at the high level, it's this API. And let's start looking into the API and seeing those concepts that Vidya talked about. So right out the bat, when we look at like the, mut the mutative endpoints, like put items, we see that we're doing an operation with an item potency token. Every operation that changes state in an abstraction requires some form of item potency token. We also start seeing these lists of these key value pairs which have that chunk number. So that allows us to dynamically handle both large data and small data. Large data shows up as chunks that are non-zero, small data shows up as chunks that are zero. We see the same thing for like our multi, uh, multi item, uh, mutate items. This is kind of like a batch API. Um, and the really nice thing here is that from a user's perspective using this API, they don't have to think about like, well, as long as I create a list of operations, they, they apply in the logical order that I think. So for example, if I delete a record and then insert a bunch of items, that happens in the logical order. And then the abstraction can translate that to Cassandra's timestamps, last rate wins using the item potency token and ordering after that. On the get item side, we have pretty straightforward predicate, what matches, and selections. But the thing I want to call out here is the pagination. So the get items response is always a page of results. Like Vidya said, if you have a streaming API, you don't know if the other side is slow or gone. So you, instead, we use pagination, which allows us to be able to speculate and hedge for every single page. That allows us to maintain those single digit millisecond SLOs. And then f finally, if that next page token is set, that means that the client has to keep consuming. Scan is very similar. Scan, you'll notice the only difference is that we don't have an ID. This is kind of a full table scan API. Um, and the main thing here is that uh, th there's actually multiple concurrent pages returned. So what we found was that users expect a common SLO for full table scans. They want to be able to scan one terabyte just as quickly as they can scan 10 terabytes of data. And the way that we performed that was with parallel range scans. Um, however, the nice thing about this abstraction is the key value abstraction makes the determination about how many concurrent cursors to generate, how many token ranges to scan. And it allows us to kind of meet, meet that, that full table scan SLO. Specifically, we're going to give them as few cursors as possible to meet the SLO, because we don't want to put too much pressure on that cluster. So kind of putting it all together, we can see all those concepts that Vidya talked about. We can see those item potency tokens. We can see chunking, large values being chunking. We can see the pagination on the read API. Um, and we can see that like, real focus on fixed size work that we can establish a an SLO on as opposed to counts. Counts we can't establish an SLO on. Returning one one gigabyte item is going to be slower than returning 100, uh, 100 kilobyte items. All right, so that sounds pretty cool. We can see the API. But how does it actually work under the hood? How do we make it work with Cassandra? Well, we do it using a pretty straightforward schema. So you'll notice that this is exactly what you would expect for a key value abstraction. The only difference is that value metadata column. Now, what's special about that value metadata column? That allows us to tell, uh, to tell the system that that data is actually located somewhere else. And in particular, it's located off in this versioned chunk table. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I'll walk through it. Uh, at that high level, we have a partition key, which is a combination of that ID and a bucket, a numeric bucket. And then we have uh, inverse sorted uh, key, inverse sorted version, and then chunk. And you can kind of see like this mapping to the item potency token, right? Like the version is going to be the nonce, the, the write time is going to be the timestamp. And then when we want to store uh, large values, like multi-megabyte or even gigabyte values into key value, uh, the base table, the, the simple key value, value metadata, now points off into this chunk table. And really key is that it points off into a locatable part of that table. So that if we need to, like, for example, re remove things around or reshard them later, we can do that transparently without the user ever knowing. And just to kind of show you the power of this, I just want to walk through a couple of examples where we have three large values. Like if we were to handle megabyte values all the time in just normal that base table, Cassandra would explode instantly. So instead, with this, what we're able to do is spread it out over mu multiple buckets. So we're taking that offset, which is some kind of consistent hash, and then every eight chunks, we're, bu we're bumping that bucket, which has the effect of spreading that data out. We can see with like a two megabyte, we're spreading it out now over more buckets. And then finally, with a 10 megabyte, we're spreading it out even over even more, so bucket 12 through 32 in this case. How does that look actually on the storage cluster? Well, it looks like this. The first eight go to these three, the next eight go to those three, and then when you have the rest, you're kind of spreading this large value out over Cassandra, and you're never asking any one Cassandra node at once to do all that work. So for example, if it's uh, eight uh, chunks of 64 kilobytes, you're only ever asking a Cassandra node to do 512K of work at a time, and then because we have that pagination system, we're only ever asking four replica sets to do work at a time. So we kind of spread out that work over a longer period of time, 
uh, which maintains our SLO. And key doesn't wake Jordan up. This also allows us to implement concurrency control because the versioning is what allows us to stage those large values. Like you can't write multiple megabytes or gigabytes of data quickly. Like that takes some time. So you have to handle concurrency. You have to handle like people might be touching that same key at the same time. And the versioning is what allows us to do that. That kind of random nonce and that item potency token, in addition to that timestamp, that's what allows us to deduplicate those two concurrent writes and then kind of stage them. And then the thing that ultimately arbitrates like what's the last write that wins is that base table. All right, so we saw how we could use novel storage layouts and kind of a two-layer system to store any size data. That also allows us to, like, if we have a partition that has lots of keys, we can eventually potentially do summarization as well, where we group those up and put them off in the chunk table. But that's future work. What about time series? All right, time series is pretty similar. The only real difference is that this, the sorted map is the key in the sorted map. Specifically, we found at Netflix that most event data stores want an inverse sort on timestamp. So they want the latest events most of the time. And the API looks pretty similar to the KV API, right? We've got the right event records. Event records contain a namespace, time series ID. This looks kind of familiar, right? And if you're a developer, one of the key benefits at Netflix is that this looks very similar to that key value abstraction. Yeah, you're storing a different kind of data, but the API and the way you interact is different. You don't have to learn a whole new database. And the one like kind of key thing I want to call out here is that the read event records API in time series always takes a time interval. And that's what's going to allow us to locate the data. And you might say, well, but Joey, you just said that we always have item potency tokens. Where's the item potency token? Well, it turns out it's hiding. So it's right, it's right there. That's the item potency token. The nice thing about time series data is they have built in item potency tokens because they're event data. There's a timestamp, and then there's an event ID. And that event ID is some kind of nonce. And again, on the read records response, we're seeing that next page token and that pagination. So again, we're seeing all those concepts applied exactly the same to have a really robust uh, setup. What's different in time series? One thing that's a little bit different is that we found that time series users wanted additional modes of acknowledgments from us. So they, uh, especially like our tracing use cases. Um, okay, so like one of the biggest use cases for time series at Netflix is this tracing data set which stores every time any service calls any other service at Netflix. Um, we have a lot of microservices. They talk to each other a lot. This data set is ridiculously big. Um, and they're writing at between one and 20 million writes per second um, into, this, into this event store. And they don't care if we drop one out of like 100 billion events. So they really just wanted us to be able to fire and forget, like send that data as fast as possible into the event store. And if something was wrong, we could deal with it kind of offline. Some users want to know that it at least has reached the abstraction and is enqueued into an in-memory queue. And then most users probably want to know that it's actually in storage. And there's kind of a trade-off here, right, between consistency and reliability. The, the stronger the durability, the less reliable it is, the higher the probability it fails. And we found at Netflix that especially with time series, people want to be able to pick between these. And that's fine. The abstraction gives them this offering as one of those namespace configuration options that video talked about. All right, so just wrapping it back, we see all those concepts again. You see those item potency tokens, different modes of acknowledging, um, a, a fixed, in this case, a fixed prohibition on size, although maybe in the future we've got dynamic chunking in our future. And then finally, fixed size work again. All right, so that, again, looks like a pretty cool API. How does it actually work? How did we make it work? And, and I'm just going to preface this with, there's some complexity ahead. And when we gave this talk internally, people were like, why is there all this complexity? And I just wanted to lead with the impact. Who here had a year of efficiency? We had a year of efficiency, yeah. This, this project saved millions of dollars for Netflix, allowed our operators to sleep better at night, and massively simplified massive scale data sets. To put it Bluntly, we had compute efficiency, operator efficiency, and developer efficiency. At Netflix, the, the complexity was worth it. What was that complexity, though? Well, we start off with uh, having like a metadata table that describes how we're going to lay out this time series. And you can see here we have a namespace. We have when that namespace, uh, the kind of start time and end time, the time interval that it's dealing with, some metadata, and a status. Let's dive into that. What are those, what are those things? What, what, what's in that metadata bucket? Um, before I get to that, this is a real example from production. This is like a blank history service. At Netflix, there's a lot of blank history services. There's like viewing history, there's impression history, there's all kinds of history stuff. Because it's really important to us to personalize your use case. It's really important for us to understand uh, your historical behavior so that we can better tune the product for you. So these, uh, impre these history service uh, data sets are some of the most valuable to Netflix. They're also some of the most massive. You can see that this one spans multiple years of data. And you can see on the right there that we have this little like, status column. Is it active? Is it deleted? Is it, is it closed? What do those statuses mean? Well, 
uh, we kind of have a state machine of these different time slices entering these different states. If, if you're familiar with Elasticsearch, this hopefully looks kind of familiar. We basically just took it straight from Elasticsearch. It's how Elasticsearch does time series data. Um, and it scales really well. It also has really nice operator techniques. So for example, in this case, we can see very clearly how large each of these times. In this particular case, there's less time series data over time. These are fixed time slices. We can also, uh, using the state of those different slices, if they're uh, active, they can accept writes. And if they're closed, closed is a really important thing for us. That is what allows us to identify that somebody didn't know the data was about to get deleted. So in, in time series, if they're trying to access a time interval that's closed, the API throws errors, saying that you can't read that data. It's outside of your window. How many times do you think people have gone, oh, no, I didn't mean that, that for that data to get deleted? How many times do people think that's happened? All the time, constantly. Constantly we get, oh, I didn't realize that there was a one hour TTL in that data. Now, if it was written with TTLs, we'd be like, well, you're SOL. Can't help you. Your data's gone. With this, we just go, oh, it's back and active, and we've changed the lifecycle policy. So this has some pretty significant operability advantages for us. Number one, we can push our clusters a lot further. Because we're doing retention with these tables instead of with compaction, we can finely tune the retention policy. And we can drive our clusters up to 80 or 90% disk full. Millions of dollars. Super high impact. Being able to decouple that retention from that TTL meant that instead of us having to go, sorry, customers, we lost your data. Instead, we can say, oh, yep, we fixed it. Control plane operation, your data is going to be around for another year. And then finally, it allows us to decouple background operations like compression and compaction. For example, we can use really aggressive Z standard compression on those older tables that aren't being read a lot. It's extremely impressive work, and I'm really proud of the team. Pro tips, some things we ran into this. Well, it turns out when you add DDL into the hot path of an abstraction, um, Jordan gets sad. So the way that we fixed this was uh, we created runway in the future. So because we know the time partitioning, we can pre-create those tables before they enter the critical path. And we can make sure that if there is like schema issues, we can deal with those ahead of time. But also, we learned that you can idempotently create tables using a with ID statement. Even in old versions of Cassandra, this is, as far as we can tell, supported back to Cassandra 2. When you create a table, you can say, like, with ID equals some UUID. And then that replaces the silly time UUID implementation in the server. I'm sorry, I'm calling it silly. It is silly. Like, it really is frustrating when you have schema disagreement that leads to, to data loss because people created the exact same table twice. This solves all of those problems, because you just say this, this item potent. Also, the thing that just landed in Cassandra 5.1 trunk, uh, transactional cluster metadata, that also will hopefully solve this problem. So we can, we can remove that hack. All right, but what does the actual time series data look like? Well, again, we've got that data, but like with a couple more buckets. Hold on, I'll walk through all the buckets. I know there are buckets. There's some time buckets, there's some event buckets, and then, of course, what you'd expect, the event time uh, going inverted uh, to that data. This looks pretty similar to key value again, just with a little bit of difference in the sort key. All right, let's go through that bucketing, because this is actually pretty key. And this is where that metadata associated with that slice comes in. So this is a, a snapshot of the metadata associated with a given time slice. And we can see that we have configuration of like how long are the time buckets, uh, how many random buckets do we want per time slice by default, and then how do we split up events between the buckets. Um, let's walk this through with some real data. So like on the x-axis there, we've got time. As we're writing new data, that data depend gets routed to these different time buckets and these different event buckets. And you might be like, dude, Joey, why so many buckets? It's a lot of buckets. We've got like three buckets. We've got tables. We've got, event we got time buckets. We've got event buckets. It's a lot of buckets. Well, the key is that when you start doing time series at scale, you realize that you need the ability to tune these different parameters. Specifically, the tables, uh, th those specify your retention period. They also specify a lower level read amplification. A common use case at Netflix is I want to store a year of data, but I'm only going to be reading a month, typically. Like a typical query will only look at a month. And that's what time buckets are for. They allow us to control that read amplification. And then finally, sometimes, even with that first two levels of sharding, you end up with really large time series. Like we like to think people who just sit there and constantly watch Netflix. Either that or they're sharing their account, one of the two. Um, and for those users, we need to be able to dynamically shard out that wide partition using random event buckets, kind of like the key value chunking uh, design. So with that, I want to hand it back to Vidi to close us out uh, with a couple of success stories, things that have yes. gone well. Yes. Uh, thanks, Joey. That uh, was a great overview of the APIs and storage engine. Now we are going to talk about some of the use cases that power uh, um, that are stored in these storage engines. Um, Key value deploys 400 plus shards. Um, around 3,000 use cases live in a key value. For time series, we have 10 petabytes, tens of petabytes of data uh, stored, events stored in the storage engine, tens of use cases uh, in time series as well. 
Cloud says one of our gaming use cases, uh, uh, all the game data, when you play, uh, play games and you move from one device to another and you want your game to resume in another device, uh, metadata about the game and how you are playing, uh, playing with the games, um, all of that is stored in uh, cloud saves. It, it has uh, uh, data uh, payloads which are sizing from um, 30 to 300 um, megabytes in size. Um, it, uh, the user calls uh, the metadata and uh, updates the game progress. Uh, it is in, primarily this use case is enabled by chunking and compression that we uh, we talked about earlier. Uh, tracing, um, Netflix tracing, as uh, Joey mentioned, uh, distributed tracing. Every microservice pushes some data about uh, uh, what they're doing um, into the tr uh, tracing shard. It's a time series data. Um, uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of services uh, send their IPC traces to uh, the time series data. Um, it is around one to two petabytes of uncompressed data. Uh, it's all immutable data. Uh, it, it's thrown away and TWCS. Um, and uh, all the strategies that Joey talked about uh, is being applied in the tracing data. The last one I'm talking, uh, I'm going to talk about is a profile level user interaction. It's called Fluid. Um, uh, per video, per profile, uh, all the pay, plays, pauses, and stops, all the events that uh, you interact with at Netflix, it, it stores that data. There are two kinds of data in Fluid. One is the key value. It actively stores all your sessions, live sessions. You, you know, stop and uh, play back. That is coming from Fluid. And it also has session history data. All the things that you did in, in a particular session is stored um, uh, in time series data. It has 800K writes per second for key value and 10K writes for time series. Um, 150K reads. Um, in uh, uh, key value and 80K reads in uh, time series uh, with the 8R TTL for uh, key value and one year TTL for time series. Uh, it's tuned heavily for uh, writes. Um, write operations are uh, heavily tuned. With that, um, what is uh, wh what are we going to do for the future? We have some uh, very innovative things coming up. Um, one is summarization. Somebody talked about wide rows uh, or wide partitions earlier. Um, with wide partitions, uh, we also have the same uh, the same problem. Some of the queue use cases uh, that we're dealing with have uh, wider partitions, and it's ever growing partitions. Uh, device key and the device ID per user is uh, ever growing as well. So for that, we need summarization. We have to chunk the data and store the uh, white partition as summarized data. That is not enough. We need to reshard the data. Uh, if it is ever growing, some buckets or a fixed number of buckets are not enough. We need to reshard as well, dynamically resharding uh, and compare and swap. Uh, everybody needs put if absent, compute if absent, compute if present. How do we uh, do all of these operations using Cassandra? Compare and set is the way to go. Uh, there are other things as well. We talked about compression. Uh, we uh, we can do dictionary compression using uh, signaling and um, uh, getting the data to know about the data. With all that, that's all we have. Uh, if you have any questions, we can take that now. Yeah, the future is bright. We're out of time. Okay, we'll take questions in the back though. Thank you all.